Because this is a virtual meeting unconnected to any specific place, the commission would like to acknowledge all of the California Native American communities all across our coast. The Coastal Commission honors and respects the diverse indigenous peoples connected to our coast. Good morning, Coastal Commissioners and audience. I'm grateful to the Coastal Commission for your efforts on behalf of the public, the wildlife, and the habitat along the California coast. California is really unusual in that we have this privilege. We're here today to bring your attention to a glitch in the Coastal Commission process. And I'll be talking about that later in the day on items 16C and 17A. But for now, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Hi, Patricia McPherson, Grassroots Coalition. Um, welcome to my den here <laughs> of work. Um, I want to say thank you um, and hello to all of the commissioners and uh, staff that are working there and also the visual folks, Billy, if that's you. Um, hello, and I uh, hope everyone is healthy and well, including Mr. Or Commissioner Padilla. Um, during this time in particular, we have no assurances that we'll ever even see each other again, let alone be in person with one another. So I think it's a reminder of just how important everything we do is and how it all comes down to number one, to be able to make a mark in this world that is positive. So keeping that in mind, I also want to thank Mr. Blumenthal and Mr. Bruno for their comments regarding protected water levels. Um, it's uh, certainly an issue that we have along the coast here in Los Angeles, certainly for Biona wetlands that you've heard me speak multiple times about protecting the groundwater resources here. Everything that was said this morning with regard to protecting that groundwater resource applies here as well. Um, and uh, I just had a question with regard to that uh, uh, bait for uh, reducing population of, of rodents. Does that also apply to raccoons or possums? And I'll be looking forward to hearing that. And I think my time is up and I thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Padilla, commissioners and staff. Uh, my name is Dr. Catherine Pease and I'm the Director of Science and Policy at Heal the Bay. I'm speaking today on behalf of the steering committee of the Wetlands Restoration Principles Coalition, consisting of Surfrider, LA Waterkeeper, the Trust for Public Land, Loyola Marymount University, Center for Urban Resilience, Friends of Biona Wetlands, and Heal the Bay. I'm here today to remind you of the urgent need for the comprehensive restoration of the Biona Wetlands in LA County, and to implore you to prioritize and champion this project so that it can move forward expeditiously. The Biona wetlands are in dire need of restoration and enhancement from an ecological and public access perspective. The science is clear and sound. Without intervention, the wetlands continue to deteriorate and action needs to be taken immediately. It has now been 17 years since the state of California purchased the wetlands and we still do not have an approved restoration plan or selection of a preferred alternative. The impacts of COVID-19 have further illustrated the urgent need for accessible green space in urban cities, especially for under-resourced communities. Restoring Biona is one critical step we can take towards providing healthy recreational and educational opportunities for communities with very little access to the outdoors. The restoration of Biona is also a tool in the fight against climate change, another ongoing global crisis. A restored Biona will be climate resilient. The restoration includes planning for decades of sea level rise, restoring ecosystem function to capture blue carbon and easing flood risk on neighboring communities. Continued delays are a detriment to this sensitive ecosystem and failure to move forward deprives Los Angeles of the thriving estuary it deserves. On behalf of the well-respected science and community-based organizations of the steering committee of the Wetlands Restoration Principles Coalition, we request a commitment from the commission to support the restoration of the Biona wetlands. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, commissioners. I'm Miriam Fono. I happen to be a resident of Playa del Rey, an admirer of the wetlands, the Biona wetlands that 
are part of Playa del Rey. And I'm also a high school English teacher. And as a high school English teacher, I ask my students always to go back to the word. The word is the action. And in asking them to find out the definition of the word, I would ask them to go to the dictionary and look up restoration. Restoration is the act of returning something to a, for a former place, owner, or condition. An ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And we don't consider um, degrading, destroying, and damaging the Biona wetlands, which is state land, further by a big dig out. And my students would not consider this in any way a restoration, although they would all prefer to see a restoration. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams, I have worked on the Monterey Bay and several other places, but the basic element right now for the state lands as a general comment is get a hold of EDR aerial photographs and find out what the coast was really like in 1923, 1928, 1933, and 1938. It was quite different from what it is now in San Francisco and especially Los Angeles. These are historic Fairchild aerial photographs that were taken every five years and provide great detail. So it's a matter as to let's put it back the way it was maybe because mother nature had a better job at it than we have done during the last 20, 40, 50 years. And I worked on the Monterey Bay Reclamation Project for Engineering Science a long time ago. And we had irrigation by treated sewage effluent. And no viruses, no bacteria were found. So for a year study. So we're quite concerned regarding desal and especially down here in the LA Orange County area. And we would like to have the Boca Chica and others return to what we can do as close to what was there in 1923 or maybe even better. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kathy Knight and I've been volunteering for 27 years to save the Biona wetlands ecosystem uh, through the um, several groups, including the Biona Ecosystem Education Project. And um, I just wanna say we're strongly opposed to the massive, massive proposed bulldozing of these wetlands. These, this area is critical. Um, and uh, I, it's, it's critical to save the, the, the system that's left there. And um, we need to do a, a careful restoration. It doesn't include changing the whole thing from a salt, freshwater wetland to a saltwater wetland. Also, I worked for many years with John Tommy Roses. He was the, he's the most likely descendant of the Tongva indigenous people there. And I wanna thank you um, for your support in opening these here, this hearings with uh, acknowledgement to the indigenous people. Um, 10,000 years they, they've been living here and it's important um, that we recognize them. And it's also a registered sacred site in California so um, for, the, for the Tongva, so it's very, very important. And I really wanna see it respected, um, respect their land. And, um, you know, he fought this bulldozing issue for a long time. And I, I just, I just wanna respect this land. And um, um, thank you very much. That's 16C, 17A combined report, but separate actions. Uh, thank you. That does bring us to 16C and 17A. There is a combined presentation by Mandy Ravel, a coastal program analyst in the Commission's South Coast District Office. And I'll turn that over to Mandy now, please. Thank you, Steve. This is a combined presentation for items 16C and 17A. 
which are applications by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to remove unpermitted drains and associated development that were installed within the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve and to restore over half an acre of willow habitat just south of the Biona Freshwater Marsh and a request to amend coastal development permit number 5170253 to allow the unpermitted drains to be removed within five years of commission action on this permit, rather than one year as required by the underlying permit. The proposed project would allow for implementation of either of the two co-equal alternatives that relate to the timing of removal of the drains, either immediately upon approval of this permit or within five years of action on the permit today in order to allow the removal to occur at the same time as the much larger Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve Restoration Project by the State Department of Fish and Game, excuse me, Department of Fish and Wildlife that is planned to be implemented within that same time frame. In the event that the larger restoration project does not occur within five years, then the applicant would proceed with complete removal of the drains. Next slide, please. The Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve totals 577 acres and is located south of Marina del Rey and east of Playa del Rey in the city of Los Angeles. The reserve is what remains of a much larger wetland system that historically covered over 2,000 acres of Marina del Rey to Venice. The project area is located in a portion of the Biona Wetlands known as Area B, which consists of approximately 385 acres and extends from Lincoln Boulevard west to develop properties along Vista del Mar and north of from the Westchester Bluffs to Bayona Creek. Although development such as oil drilling operations, road construction and fill, dredged material disposal, and farming eliminated a lot of wetland habitat, all of the remaining wetland areas in this location provide habitat for many species of native plants and animals. The subject drains are located on either side of Culver Boulevard, indicated on this slide within the orange circle. In 1991, the Commission approved Coastal Development Permit Number 591-463 for the construction of the 26.1 acre Biona Freshwater Marsh Restoration Project southeast of the drains and the main drain line, which runs from the Biona Freshwater Marsh to Biona Creek. The subject drains were not included as a part of those approved plans. Beginning in 2013, Commission Enforcement staff notified Playa Capital Company and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which took ownership of the reserve in 2004 of the alleged violation. Pursuant to a settlement agreement, which was Grassroots Coalition versus California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the department submitted an application for coastal development permit number 5170253 in 2017, requesting authorization to cap the unpermitted drains as an interim measure to prevent the drains from functioning until the drains could be removed during the larger Biona Wetlands Restoration Project, which was in the initial planning stages at that time. Next slide, please. In December of 2017, the commission approved coastal development permit 5170253 and required the drains to be sealed and also required the department to apply for a separate permit to remove the unpermitted drains and associated pipes within 180 days of commission action and for the unpermitted drains to be removed within one year of commission action on the new application. In January of 2018, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife sealed the drains by inserting a metal sleeve into the interior of both risers to cover all of the weep holes sealed the weep holes and drain lids with marine grade structural epoxy adhesive and bolted down the lids with L brackets to ensure the lids could not be removed. Staff would like to note here that a member of the public recently notified commission staff and the department acknowledges that there is a small hole in the sealant of the south drain that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has proposed to repair as a component of this project. Several members of the public have raised concerns that methane may be leaking from the south drain, and the department has submitted a report written by Los Angeles County Fire Department Health Hazmat personnel demonstrating that no hazardous gases were detected. This is addressed in the addendum, as well as an updated revised plans condition requiring the department to conduct annual monitoring of the drains to ensure they remain sealed. Next slide, please. The application before you today proposes to remove two drain risers, lateral culverts, and approximately 178 linear feet of connecting pipelines. 
the scope of work involves excavation of approximately 22,000 square feet of square feet to unearth and expose the pipes and associated structures and remove them. As pipeline sections are removed, the contractor will begin replacing excavated material back into the trench to reduce the size and volume of spoil piles. Each trench will be backfilled with approximately 70 cubic yards of fill, graded and smoothed. Finally, disturbed areas will be hydro seeded with native grasses and vegetation for erosion control. Although special condition four of the underlying CDP required the unpermitted drains and associated pipes to be removed within one year of commission action on this new application, the project disturbance and potential adverse impacts related to full removal were not fully analyzed in that staff report. And the department maintains that immediate excavation of the area, which is located within the footprint of the larger restoration effort proposed to occur within the next five years, would unnecessarily cause adverse impacts to natural and cultural resources in the area. In order to restore degraded wetland habitat and functions within the Biona Reserve, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is proposing a large scale effort to restore, enhance, and establish native coastal wetland and upland habitats on approximately 577 acres within the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. Initial public review for the draft EIS EIR began in 2017 for purposes of CEQA, and the final EIR was certified in, in December of 2019. At this time, the projected timeline for the Biona Wetlands Restoration Plan is approximately three to five years. The drains were sealed in, two, in January 2018, rendering them non-functional and inert, and no significant impacts to natural resources are expected in the next one to five years due to the presence of the buried drains and risers. However, undertaking excavation efforts in this location twice for immediate removal of the drains and pipes and again for the large scale restoration project would double the disturbance and potential impacts to natural and cultural resources. In addition, the 577 acre wetlands wide restoration project will be designed to return the topography and wetland habitat to a more natural state in line with the overall project immediately following removal of the drains and will maintain the habitat over time. In order to minimize impacts to potential natural and cultural resources, Commission staff recommends approval of the removal of the unpermitted drains in five years, so that removal may occur in conjunction with the larger restoration. Consequently, the department is now requesting as a part of this project and its related amendment to revise special condition four of the underlying CDP that two options be analyzed as co-equal project descriptions to remove the drains and pipes, either one immediately upon approval of the permit or two within five years of commission action on the permit to allow for the removal of the pipes to occur concurrently with the larger restoration. Special Condition 4 of Coastal Development Permit 5170253 required that follow-up permit application include a plan to remove the unpermitted drains and a proposal to provide habitat restoration with appropriate native wetland species at a minimum ratio of 4 to 1 of revegetation area to area impacted by the drains. And the habitat restoration is required to address direct impacts associated with the installation of the drains and the temporal impacts of dewatering the surrounding habitat since approximately 1996. Dr. Jonna Engel, the Commission staff senior ecologist, will now discuss the project site physical and biological resources. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. While it would have been better to analyze the installation impacts and the physical and biological zone of influence of the drains during a permit review process, we have done our best to examine these things after the fact. CDFW has explored what the footprint of impact would be for removing the drains, and we have used this to determine the area that was disturbed during the initial drain installation. This exhibit shows the drains and pipes depicted by the solid yellow lines. You can see how they tie into the freshwater marsh storm overflow drain outlined with thin yellow lines. The dotted yellow lines mark the areas that would be disturbed during drain installation or removal. The impact area is 0.23 acres around the north drain and 0.27 acres around the south drain. It is important to point out that the drains and pipes are located in a disturbed raised area characterized by fill from several projects, including channelization of Biona Creek, 
and construction of Culver Boulevard and the Freshwater Marsh Storm over Overflow Drain. In fact, when the Freshwater Marsh Storm Overflow Drain was constructed, a large amount of fill was imported to build up support for the drain pipe and to cover it. This created a wide raised ridge. Next slide, please. I want to explain the topography around each drain with this exhibit and with the next exhibit, I hope to explain to you how the hydrology of the area works. The north drain denoted by the top red circle is located at eight feet above mean sea level on a slope immediately adjacent to Culver Boulevard. The drain is in a small depression surrounded by higher topography. Just northeast of it, the surrounding area rises to 10 feet before descending again such that the north drain is separated from the natural wetland area to the northeast. The drain on the south side of Culver, Culver Boulevard, denoted by the lower red circle, sits at 5.8 feet above mean sea level and is immediately surrounded by higher elevations, six feet and up in all directions, separating it from the large natural wetland area to the northeast. The topography around each drain reveals how small their area of influence is. Next slide, please. This exhibit is a representation of the surface water hydrology of the area around the drains from a study conducted by SOMAS in 2017, and it depicts a much larger area than the last exhibit. The two drains are shown by the small red dots. The important information to convey to you is that both drains are outside of and separated from what SOMAS calls the storage basins, which contain natural wetland habitat, outlined in blue here, by higher elevations as shown by the topography on the last exhibit. So only when the wetland areas fill up during a huge storm would water overflow into the north or south drains. Before the drains were capped, water from the freshwater marsh storm overflow out, uh, sorry, storm outflow drain could burp into the small depressional areas around the drains under certain circumstances. The upshot of this is that the zone of influence of each drain is extremely limited. Both drains, as shown in the exhibit, are outside the natural wetland habitat and only drain small areas. Somas found that the area drained by the north drain is approximately 200 square feet and the area drained by the south drain is approximately 400 square feet. In other words, as the hydrology study concludes, the drains have had an extremely minimal hydrological impact on the surrounding area. You may wonder why these drains were added to the freshwater marsh storm overflow system in the first place. As I understand it, they were added because the city of LA wanted to protect Culver Boulevard from flooding. However, to date, they have never functioned in that manner because it would take a huge storm event, much larger than a hundred year storm, for the wetlands to fill and flood nearly three feet beyond their borders to reach Culver Boulevard. If you have further questions about the topography or hydrology, I am happy to try and answer them and the SOMAS hydrologist, Mike Crehan, who has worked in the area is also available. Next slide, please. During a site visit in February 2019, I observed the physical and biological conditions surrounding the two drains. The area surrounding both drains is characterized by disturbed upland rural habitat dominated by non-native and invasive species, including annual European grasses, ice plant, black mustard, castor bean, and a few scattered native coastal sage shrub species, including coyote bush. In the photo of the view to the east, you can see the disturbed upland ruderal habitat. In the photo of the view to the west, you can see ice plant surrounding the north drain. And in the photo of the view to the south, you can see dead and dying mustard in the foreground and castor bean in the background. Next slide, please. In this slide with photos of the south drain, the view to the north shows the drain surrounded by dead and dying non-native invasive black mustard. In the view to the south, you can see a small patch of salt marsh pickleweed on the right and the rise in elevation up the path onto the ridge where the drain pipe connects to the freshwater marsh storm outflow pipe. I confirmed during my site visit that the areas where the drain and pipe installations occurred 
with the exception of approximately 400 square feet of salt marsh wetland around the south drain, are dominated by non-native and invasive ruderal vegetation that does not rise to the level of environmentally sensitive habitat or ESHA. Next slide. We use the drain removal impact area values as a proxy for the drain installation footprint and determined that the area CDFW would need to restore is 0.53 acres. The mitigation we have agreed to is removal of 0.6 acres of pampas grass and any other invasive non-native species plant, comma, planting native arroyo willow, mule fat, and California blackberry, and five years of monitoring for success. The long-term goal of the mitigation is to sustain native vegetation and provide suitable habitat for native wildlife, including the state and federally endangered least bell vireo. I believe the proposed mitigation compensates for the original installation of the drains and temporal wetland impacts at the south drain. Next slide. It is my professional opinion that the drains, since installation and currently, are not significantly impacting the project area. I am basing my findings on 1991 and 2006 vegetation map, maps, Edith Reed's 2013 and 2018 biological surveys and reports, the SOMAS hydrology report, current and historical aerial photographs, and my site visit observations. Given that removing the drains now would mean that the area would be disturbed twice, and that I have found that the drains have not historically and are not currently significantly impacting the immediate area, I believe that leaving the drains in place for future removal during a large-scale 577-acre wetlands-wide restoration project that is planned to be undertaken by CDFW is the most parsimonious and least environmentally damaging approach. Mandy? Yes, thank you, Dr. Engel. Staff would note that there is an addendum for this item which addresses two changes to conditions and responses to correspondence, particularly that special condition one requires a revised plan to repair the leak in the south drain and requires the department to conduct annual inspections and maintenance until the drains are removed in their entirety. In closing, the applicant is proposing complete removal of the two unpermitted drains and their associated structures with two co-equal alternatives that would allow for implementation of either of the two alternatives that relate to the timing of removal of the drains either immediately upon approval of this permit or within five years of action on the permit today in order to allow the removal to occur at the same time as the larger wetlands restoration project that is going to be conducted by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to be implemented within the, that same time frame. In the event that the larger restoration project does not occur within five years, then the applicant would proceed with complete removal of the drains. Staff is recommending that the commission approve the project as proposed to allow for flexibility in the timing for removal and to allow the sealed drains and pipes to remain in place until the larger wetland restoration occurs, given as Dr. Engel explained, this would be the least environmentally damaging alternative and will be the least disruptive to the habitat in the project area over time, consistent with the resource protection policies of the Coastal Act. I would note as a reminder that to accomplish this recommendation, there are two separate actions the commission must vote on today. And it is necessary for the commission to first take action on item 17A, the amendment to the previously approved CDP before taking action on item 16C, the related new CDP application. The first motion to approve the CDP amendment can be found on page four of the staff report for item 17A. And the second motion to approve the related CDP can be found on page five of the staff report for item 16C. This concludes staff presentation and we are available for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ravel. Well done as always. Uh, let's bring in the representatives from the um, Fish and Wildlife, the applicant. Yes, Mr. Chair, at this moment, I have Richard Berg and Richard Brody as the applicants with Kevin Takei as the applicant's representative. Right now, Richard Berg is the only one says he's here to speak, so he is now in the meeting and can unmute himself and start his camera and state his name for the record. Yes, can you hear me? We yes. can hear you and see you. 
Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank right. you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Richard Berg. I'm an environmental program manager. Mr. Berg, how much time might you need? To oh, present? I'm sorry. Uh, I've been practicing. If, if, if I could have 10 minutes, I may take a little less because uh, some of the slides Mandy and Jana went through are similar to mine. So I could probably rush through those fairly quickly. Okay, what I'll do is look, you'll have 10 minutes and then that would include any time for rebuttal potentially as well. So you might want to shave off a minute or two to reserve that time. But please Fantastic. proceed. Thank you so much. Again, my name is uh, Richard Berg. I'm an environmental program manager, at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, first off, I'd just like to uh, offer my condolences and deepest sympathies to uh, Gabe's family. I have worked with Gabe here in San Diego, both with state parks and with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, he was a pleasure to work with and will definitely be missed. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank and offer my sincere appreciation to commission staff who have worked very diligently and most professionally to assist the department on the forthcoming agenda items. Uh, slide one, uh, the Bayona Wetland Ecological Reserve is located in Los Angeles, California amidst one of the largest urban populations in the world. As Mandy mentioned the historic wetland ecosystem once spanned more than 2,100 acres from Playa del Rey to Venice and inland to Baldwin Hills. Uh, next slide, please. Although the wetlands, Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve is the largest coastal wetland complex in Los Angeles County, it has deteriorated to the point where it no longer sustains vital ecosystem functions and is particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. Next slide, please. The reserve was purchased from 2003 to 2004 and designated as an ecological reserve by the Fish and Game Commission in 2005. And next slide, please. Over 90% of wetlands in California have been lost to development and human alteration, and over 95% have been lost in Los Angeles County. Next slide, please. In approximately 2005, the department started work on the Biona Wetlands Restoration Project. The project is a scientifically based restoration and enhancement project that will restore the damaged and degrading reserve. The project goals focus on restoring wetland and other ecological functions within the reserve, maintaining existing levels of flood risk management and restoring and improving public access for compatible recreational and educational opportunities that are currently limited within the reserve. The project would be the largest wetland restoration in Los Angeles County. Specifically, the project would restore, enhance, and establish native coastal wetland and upland wetland habitat on approximately 566 acres within the reserve. Once restored, the reserve will be the largest open coastal space available to the public in the city of Los Angeles. Next slide, please. In December of 2019, the department publicly released its final environmental impact in that report. That report analyzed the potential significant environmental effects of implementing the restoration project. After the department approves the project, it can proceed forward final design and securing permits a process expected to take three to five years. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has delayed the certification of PDR and the approval of the project. Next slide, please. It's not unusual for ecological reserves to be closed to the public for protection of rare, threatened, endangered native plants, wildlife, aquatic organisms, and specialized terrestrial or aquatic habitat types. That said, there currently is limited public access within the reserve, including three baseball fields in Area C and activities by two partners in West Area B. Nearly 9,500 school children visited the reserve in 2019 as part of the environmental education programs, with approximately half of those children attending from Title I schools. In addition, over 3,000 volunteers spent over 9,000 hours volunteering within the reserve. The restoration proposes to create approximately five and a half miles of bike and pedestrian only trails with interpretive and learning opportunities focused on the natural and cultural resources. In addition, the project would include constructing approximately 2,000 linear feet of elevated boardwalks 
to allow visitors to walk adjacent to the wetlands and obtain closer habitat and wildlife viewing. Uh, next slide, please. Biona is complicated and the reserve has several legacy structures and issues, including illegal trespass and illegal dumping, among others. Existing parking lots have garnered attention and the future of these lots are analyzed in the EIR. The reserve is also located atop one of the region's gas storage facilities, more than a mile below the reserve. The EIR analyzes the removal of the gas company monitoring wells associated with this facility to help repair some of the habitat fragmentation occurring due to their presence. And lastly, the two drains that are on today's agenda. There's a lot going on at Bayona and the drains are one of many issues. And next slide, please. The drains were installed by the former landowner sometime after 1995 prior to department acquiring the property. The department investigated claims to determine if the drains negatively impacted the reserve's ecological values. The department considered the following. There was more wetland associated vegetation around the south drain in 2013 as compared to when the drain was installed. The relative small size of the drains, the lack of evidence or any indication that the drains were in fact having a measurable negative effect on the reserve's ecological values and that the department intended to remove the drains as part of any restoration. With that in mind, the department determined that removing the drains at that time was at a lower priority. In 2018, January 2018, Playa Capital kept the drains at the request and oversight of the department. As Mandy said, the drains were sealed by inserting a metal sleeve into the interior of both drains to cover all the weep holes sealed the weep holes and drained lids with high strength structural epoxy paste adhesive that is suitable for potable water, water, excuse me, water in a salt water environment, and then bolted down the lids to ensure they could not be removed. Next slide, please. Staff monitored the drains during the rainy season in 1819 and documented ponding at the South Drain. In March and April of 2020, air bubbles were observed emanating from the South Drain by an interested party. On July 4th, the department received an email from a concerned citizen that the drain appeared to be leaking and methane may be escaping. On July 6th, department staff inspected the two drains. Visual observations and photos did not indicate any clear compromise of the seal. At approximately 7.30 in the morning, no airflow could be heard or otherwise detected from the South Drain. But when inspected again at 11.30 that same morning, it was determined to have a small leak in a portion of the seal between the cap and the drain. When the airflow was rechecked again at 1400 hours, it was again undetectable. And next slide, please. At the request of the department, the Los Angeles County Fire Department hazmat unit measured for harmful gas leaks. On July 9th and again on July 20th, department staff met LA County Fire Department hazmat personnel at both the North and South drains, attempting to detect and or measure any potential hazardous gas present and or escaping from the drains. And next slide, please. The results of both days' testings were negative at both drain sites, and the department received the hazmat unit report on August 5th. And next slide, please. But to be clear, the department would not allow the drains to be installed in the reserve today because such installation could ne negatively affect the reserve's ecological value without any measurable benefit to the reserve. To install drains today would require bringing in construction equipment to the reserve, excavating soil and disturbing habitat, actions with immediate negative effects and no long-term benefit to the reserve's ecological values. The same applies to removing the drains. Thus, absent any ecological values related to removing the drains now, a decision to remove the drains now is inconsistent with the department's mission. Also factoring into the department's decision-making process is the fact that the planned restoration for the reserve would remove all the drains and all associated components. Uh, next slide, please. 
Any excavation and habitat disturbance can have negative effects. So the department does not allow such activity in an ecological reserve unless it, it is necessary. It is possible to mitigate the impacts of removing the drains immediately. However, disturbing this particular area of the reserve twice, i.e. once now removing the drains and a second time during the larger restoration without somehow doubling the ecological benefit is inconsistent with the department's management directives. Uh, last slide. Great. Uh, thank you for this time and ability to give this brief presentation. Uh, um, we'll be available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Berg. All right. Uh, does that conclude? Did I ask for ex parties on this item? I need to recall if I didn't. Are there any members who want to report ex parte? Mr. Uranga? No, I did not have an ex parte. I was just going to comment on the, the project. Okay, I want to take, uh, is it okay to hold off until we take our speakers? We have, Absolutely. We have a few. All right, um, it's my understanding that we have at least one, two, three, four, five group presentation requests plus an additional 11 individual speakers. Is that correct, staff? Yes, Mr. Chair, we do have okay. five groups. All right, and each, uh, with the exception of grassroots, which will have two people speaking on behalf of the group, each of the other four groups will have one person speaking on behalf of the group, is that correct? That is correct. All right, this is how we're gonna handle this, given Keep, we need to keep commissioners focused and productive. That, that includes the chair. Uh, and we have some severe time constraints. Each group presentation will have up to five minutes to present. When you come in, state your name for the record and the group that you represent, you will have up to five minutes. Individual speakers, uh, we will start, will have up to two minutes to present, same drill. So if uh, staff go ahead, however you'd like to just bring in the speakers, uh, in whatever order you brought them into the room. Sounds good. Um, up first, we have Patricia McPherson from Grassroots Coalition, followed by Bill Delorme, also from Grassroots Coalition. Ms. McPherson, you are now in the meeting. You can unmute uh, yourself, start your video, and state your name for the record. McPherson, Grassroots Coalition. Who is the other speaker for Grassroots? I'm not aware. I have uh, Bill Delorme, but I'm not located. No, he's seated his time. Thank you. I see. Okay. All right, Patricia, you're on. You'll have up to five minutes. Um, if I could just for clarification here, you said two speakers for uh, Grassroots Coalition, five minutes each. Bill DeLorme is not speaking on behalf. So does that mean as a group I receive 10 minutes or? It means as a group you have five minutes. If, you're if you are the speaker for the group, you have a total of five minutes. You can take it all yourself or you and the other speaker on behalf of the group can split it up but the group has five minutes total. All right, Patricia McPherson, Grassroots Coalition. Um, I want to bring your attention to the fact that all of this is under the Freshwater Marsh Systems Coastal Development Permit 591463. So there is a need for it to adhere to the entire system and how everything relates to itself within that system. Um, I think that the elephant in this room today is the fact that approving the staff's reports here and allowing CDFW to go ahead with this this way is tantamount to approving their plan, their project, um, conversion of this into a, a saltwater area as opposed to a predominantly freshwater seasonal wetland. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the, they are tying this to the restoration which was disallowed by the commissioners in 2017 with a unanimous vote that disallowed tying the two together. And I would like to quote to you from uh, Commissioner Peskin, it's not my problem that Fish and Games doing a DEIR that's going to be done um, is in some amount of time in the future. The problem is there is a violation and it has to be cured. The violation has not been cured. It's been seven years since 2013, and the Coastal Commission asked for it to be resolved. Um, this dragging of the feet has allowed new commissioners, 
and certainly allowed for CDFW to again bring the same issue that was already decided upon by the commissioners in 2017. As uh, Commissioner Peskin said, uh, half a solution of not getting rid of the uh, drains is our fellow sister agency has bigger future plans, which you know are remarkably complicated. And I don't want to opine on whether a freshwater body should become a saltwater body and 15 feet of dirt should be removed and put to the other side. We'll save that for another day. I believe that addresses the idea that this does not tie this to the restoration and should not be tied. This thing has not been certified and yet approving this um, and approving these, all of these reports, for instance, when Ms. Engels is discussing this area, um, and CDF discusses this area as, as wanting to put this off, their whole intention, every plan includes putting a 30 to 40 foot berm on top of this area, which is total destruction of this area. Whereas if this were done now, and had it been done seven years ago, it would have had a chance to heal and, and the public would be able to see and the commissioners would be able to see that this is a thriving area already and does not need or deserve fill to be placed on top, which Coastal Commission staff in the DEIR response has already stated that fill is contrary to the Coastal Act and that the berms are a red herring and they are simply fill. Um, Ms. Engels uh, has now put out an addendum that I only see today where she cites the area is not an ESHA. Well, if the area is not an ESHA, it would seem to me that it has now taken away Fish and Wildlife's whole premise for putting this off in the first place with all of their wildlife that they're saying that lives on this area that they don't want to harm. Well, Ms. Engels agrees there is nothing here. So therefore, why wouldn't you take this opportunity to fix this, take the drains out as you stated to do in 2017 and let this area heal. Um, getting over quickly to the methane issues. Um, first of all, HAZMAT is not an agency that comes to a site to determine what gases are in that drain. Shortly, you'll see a videotape where I tent the area um, and I put in a register that simply registers for flammable gas or not. And it does register flammable gas. My testing is there to convey the need and necessity to have proper evaluation done of this, a, a scientific prudent evaluation. And hazmat setting a, a device next to it, picking up ambient air, does not, does not tell you that. Um, Uh, CDFW also said they have no equipment, but they do have OSPR, which is the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. In 2005, I asked them to come to Biona Wetlands and test an area to the east uh, or the, to the west of University City Syndicate, which is also outgassing. Um, these oil field gas issues, and they were turned away by Playa Vista but they came to do the testing. So Fish and Wildlife is disingenuous in citing that there is do this type of testing for them. I have much more, but I'm obviously not allowed. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. Next group representative, Steph. Next group representative is, I'm sorry for mispronouncing this name, Nasa Frechet, and she is representing the Friends of Bayonet Wetlands. Ms. Nasa, you are now in the meeting and you can unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners and staff. My name is Nessa Frechette and I'm the manager of scientific programs for Friends of Bona Wetlands. Uh, I won't need the full five minutes. I think that the, uh, the presentations that were, that were done so far are, were very thorough. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Bona Wetlands, Heal the Bay and Surfrider South Bay in support of the commission staff recommendation on this agenda item. We support the commission staff recommendation that the drains be removed within five years so that the removal may occur in conjunction with the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve restoration in order to reduce habitat and wildlife impacts by limiting disturbance. Since the drains have already been sealed and therefore cannot result in any additional impacts, 
it makes the most sense ecologically to wait until the full scale restoration takes place to remove the drains and restore the area rather than disturbing the habitat multiple times. We support the offsite mitigation proposal of 0.6 acres of riparian habitat that would occur in the rest uh, that would occur in Southeast area B alongside the freshwater marsh consisting of willow mule fat and other riparian species. The federally endangered least bells vireo and the state species of special concern, the yellow breasted chat, as well as other riparian dependent wildlife, which nest in the currently existing willow habitat will benefit from this mitigation. Furthermore, the site will be improved by the removal of a large monoculture of highly invasive pompous grass that continues to spread throughout the reserve and adjacent areas. This site is ideal because it expands habitat that is currently being used by sensitive species and it will not be disturbed by future restoration efforts, unlike the current uh, drain site. This plan is superior to implementing restoration at the site of the drains, which would be impacted by future restoration. The sooner that this mitigation can be implemented, the sooner it will have benefits for the wildlife at Biona. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. And we encourage you to support the staff commission's recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Fischette. Great, thank you. Our next speaker is Walter Lamb. Uh, you are in the meeting. You may unmute yourself and start your video for your presentation. Be sure to restate your name for the record, please. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Um, not sure why I'm not coming up on this. Oh, I got to start the video here. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Walter Lamb. I represent the Bino Wetlands Land Trust. Still not sure why I'm not coming up on the screen, but um, we can see you and hear you. Okay, that's good. Um, so there's a lot of complex information here. Unfortunately, with the Bino Wetlands, things do get oftentimes broken down into sort of simplistic binary arguments. I've read and listened to the staff report, and it seems like many issues are being conflated into one policy recommendation. What I'm reading and hearing is that commission staff have determined, regardless of the restoration, that the negative impacts of removing the drains would offset any potential environmental benefit. If that's true, and I don't have enough information today to, to make an argument one way or the other, I'm, I'm skeptical because there's so much reliance on SOMAS and Edith Reed, who are two um, consultants to the violator, to, to Playa Vista. Um, but assuming it's true, the logical policy recommendation would not be to extend for five years that action. It would be to, for you to make a determination that it, that, it, that it need not occur. And so the concern is that you're basing this on a restoration plan that has not been certified. I believe the staff originally said that it was certified in December. That's not correct. It was released. It still hasn't been certified. Our records indicate that the delay is not the result of COVID-19, but a result of other issues, such as a discrepancy um, in the flood control standard that was used in the state's environmental impact report, which is going to be different than what the federal environmental impact statement uses. That federal environmental impact statement is at least two years away. When it comes out, it's almost certainly going to be substantially different uh, to the point where the EIR, the state EIR, will need to be revised and recirculated. Then you have all the permitting, including you, your agency. And it's concerning to hear the project described as though it were already approved by the commission. Not only have you not approved it, but your staff raised some serious concerns, including with regard to habitat uh, impact to building Savannah Sparrow and other species. And it is a bit ironic that we're talking about a temporary limited disturbance and delaying that to what's going to be a thorough and permanent elimination of this same habitat. Um, I would encourage you again to read your staff's comments to the draft EIR that were submitted in 2018. I think Mr. Ravel was one of the signatories for those comments. So what I would ask you to do is take a step back and think about what you're being asked to decide today if it's the case that the negative impact of pulling up these drains is actually uh, outweighs the benefits of pulling up those drains. 
then it would make no sense for you to adopt a policy that they should still be removed in five years. I will tell you right now, and I'm not trying to, to um, be provocative. There is no way that this restoration activity is gonna occur within five years. If you go on Fish and Wildlife's own website, you'll start to see some of the timelines um, that they've documented that have to occur. When you had this discussion in 2000, I believe 17, Commissioner Turnbull Sanders asked Mr. Takei, legal counsel for Fish and Wildlife to give an estimate of when the draft AR was gonna come out. And he said honestly at the time that he didn't wanna do that because he was sure it would be wrong. Every single timeline that Fish and Wildlife has proposed for this restoration has been off by a magnitude um, of years. It is just simply not going to be the case that within five years, this restoration is gonna occur. You haven't considered it yet. It still has to come before you. It's complex. The last thing that the Bino Wetlands needs right now is for agencies to be jumping into an existing echo chamber. Uh, earlier today, Dr. Peace from Heal the Bay asked you to make a commitment to this project without actually having it come before you. And, and we are up uh, against this all the time. It was actually stakeholders that found these drains, stakeholders that found the leak, stakeholders that litigated to force the capping of these drains. None of that happened because Fish and Wildlife or Playa Vista or Somas or Edith Reed uh, undertook that activity. And it seems that no matter how much evidence we bring before you, um, you're more likely to listen to people who are saying, I believe this because somebody told me. And that's exactly the kind of echo, cha echo chamber we need to avoid. Thank you very much for your time. It was very generous. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Next, we have uh, Kathy Knight, followed by Dr. Clyde Williams. Uh, Ms. Knight, uh, we have unmuted you. You may unmute yourself again and start your video for your presentation. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not sure how to put my picture up there, but that's fine. Um, let me see. Uh, start my video. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, my name is Kathy Knight. And um, I'm with the Biona Ecosystem Education Project. Um, we've been working for over 30 years uh, to save this uh, important treasure on our coast here, the Biona Wetlands. And it's the lower point of the Biona watershed in Los Angeles. It's very, very important. It's, it's a freshwater wetland. And um, it's uh, uh, important freshwater aquifers are underneath it also. So, um, Unfortunately, there's a proposed controversial um, proposal, as we've been hearing, of a non-restoration of massive bulldozing plan to change it into a saltwater bay. Um, and I think we think it's very important that this, that the drains that have been there be removed and that they not be tied in, that you don't, that you, we oppose them being tied in to, um, to this um, rest, proposed restoration plan that uh, many groups are opposed to and would uh, damage the wetlands by being a huge, it would just be a massive bulldozing. So we don't want to see this tied into that plan. And as other people have said, it could take way more than five years. Uh, it's, it's so destructive, this, this idea. So also uh, we're concerned that there's an idea of the fish and wildlife putting fill on top of where the drains are. And this would be changing wetland habitat to upland habitat. The Coastal Act disallows destruction of wetlands from fill and it's illegal under the California Coastal Act to mitigate destruction of resources. So we ask that you please not um, support this and um, please uphold your unanimous decision uh, for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to remove these drains within one year that was made in December of uh, 2019. Thank you, Ms. Nang. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Did oh. was that an error on the part, the alarm that went off just now? Was that an error? Uh, I think that might've been my phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, I forgive me. I thought it was our timer. Please forgive me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so, and also we're concerned about, you know, that the Somas Corporation has, was used by Playa Vista across the street um, 
for uh, for their consultant. And these uh, Playa Vista, there was a proposal to put 20 foot high berms along the wetlands there that would protect Playa Vista from tsunamis because they didn't do their own um, flood control uh, protection from that. And so we're concerned that this might be tied in to um, the berms that, that are along, that would are proposed along Bion the um, Lincoln Boulevard at the Bayona wetlands. Um, and um, that's, that's not appropriate. Um, and uh, the berms would also require pesticides to keep the wildlife off of them. So that wouldn't be good either. And um, so we ask you to uh, please not, to please do not approve this amendment and um, do not allow this drain removal to be tied into this controversial proposed non-restoration plan to change it into a saltwater bay. It's, it's just, um, it's just, it's just doesn't make sense and they should just be removed on, on their own. You know, for, for, for the right reason now, within a year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Knight. Okay, our uh, last group presentation is with Dr. Clyde Williams. After that, we'll have a uh, public uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Williams, I will unmute you and allow you to uh, present to the commission. Hello, Dr. Yes, Tom Williams, Fit Citizens Coalition for a Safe Community, also known as Clyde T. Williams. Um, the basic element is this is an ecological reserve. It should be a freshwater marsh, area where. So the question is from Bayona Creek to the uplands, convert it back to a freshwater marsh. Now, regarding the excavation of a pipe, you don't do that anymore. You fill it up with cement slurry and cut off the risers so that they do not ob obstruct the surface. You do not have to remove the whole thing. Fill it up with cement slurry, standard practice of the oil and gas industry and the storm drain industry. We don't remove sewers, drains, or very large pipes anymore. You leave them in place, but you make them structurally sound by filling them with cement. So get rid of that part. Uh, do it now. Basic element. This had a permit. Who did the drawings for the permit? Who did the drawings maybe for as built? And who certified those drawings as being complete and adequate for the state of California and for their certification as a certified engineer or geotechnical engineer? Somebody's license needs to be pulled. It was wrong to do. It was illegal to put them in, but let's deal with what is there now. Fill them up with cement slurry and then remove all materials which obstructs the development of future freshwater marshes. I've done seawater marshes, estuarine marshes up in San Francisco Bay. We did a whole bunch of things. And the main thing is get that water back. And you might say there's several sources of fresh groundwater in the area and for rainfall. So let's get it done right. You don't have to excavate, fill it up with cement, and then redo the surface materials to promote freshwater marsh, not just wetlands, but freshwater wetlands. So, uh, that's about it. It is an ecological reserve. I have been working in the area before in the night in 2020 and 2100. Uh, I was a consultant to the CPUC for the Playa del Rey gas field uh, ventures with the PUC. And we had problems then. We're having problems now with the gas. I have degrees in paleontology and done a lot of oil and gas development. 
There is gas there. There is H2S there. There is CH4 there. There's other gases also. And these may be, quotes, natural or they're induced by the uh, Southern California Gas Company. And that is a different issue, but it affects the freshwater marshes because with gas, with H2S, you oftentimes get salt water. So we're quite concerned regarding the entire issue. This is an ecological reserve. It should be a freshwater wetland or marsh. Let's get it back to what it was in 1923 before all of the dredging went on and make it a real resource for the children of the schools to visit what used to be there and what can be there. And should document how the freshwater marsh is returned to the freshwater and to document that and to provide it to LA Unified and others as an example of how the Coastal Commission has done it right finally. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And we'll move to individual speakers now. Must be having a technical difficulty here, Mr. Chairman. Just a minute. I will find out what happened to them, sir. So I believe that Leslie Purcell is the next speaker and she appears to be already brought into the meeting. So she could unmute herself. Maybe we could get on with the next speaker. Okay. Hi, this is Leslie Purcell. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm one of the folks that has worked for many years on helping to preserve and save and protect the Biona wetlands area. And um, I just feel like this is very inappropriate to try and tie this removal of the drains to this um, so-called restoration project, which is in the future and has not actually been formally proposed. Um, the FEIS, which is also required under the federal government, has not yet been released. And so there are many problems with tying what's, what's a fairly simple solution to something that is very problematic and far into the future. And, and the, the main proposal by the Fish and, California Fish and Wildlife pretends to be a restoration, but in fact, it's a, a creation of a saltwater inlet, which is not a restoration and would be very damaging to our public lands that we've all worked so hard to protect and preserve. So I think that it behooves the commission to go forward and um, not to vote in favor of this uh, permit at this time, not to, to endorse the, the staff report and proposal, but in fact, to require the former decision, which was to remove the drains, which was within a year and now would be as soon as possible. <laughs> anyway, I would just also like to say that I used to be aware that there was much more water in that area before the drains were there. And that's Thank anecdotal, you. but my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Did Thank we resolve the technical issue with? Yes, my uh, system decided to freeze on me. My apologies for that. Thank you, Ms. Warren, for stepping in. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Judith Davies. Ms. Davies, you may uh, start your video and unmute yourself and begin to talk. Thank you. Do it. Okay, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak. I'm presenting this as a facilitator on behalf of um, two of the Tongva uh, representatives 
uh, both John Tommy Rosas and then um, with a letter of support by Mr. Anthony Morales, who is the uh, chief of the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians. So um, let's see, we could, this is just an overview to see that the, the amount of dewatering has been going on for years of fresh water from different directions. Uh, so we could go to the next slide. John Tommy Rosas has worked for years and years um, as the most likely descendant, also uh, as a tribal litigator for the Gabrielino Tongva Indians of the California Tribal Council, among other capacities. Uh, he spent many years researching, fact-checking, analyzing, and refuting the current plans under the EIR for Biona. And he's been creating alternative freshwater plans for the Biona wetlands, which is registered now uh, with the Native American Heritage Commission as a registered sacred site, which includes all waters, lands, and sites within it. And you can see he has his uh, up on the top here, you can refer to go see these uh, YouTube uh, condensed 28 minutes of various video videos that he's put together with these re research um, findings and maps and so on and, and uh, overlays and renderings that he's been doing on this web on this uh, on his own website, the YouTube condenses it. Um, and you can see in the upper corner there, his rendering of what those berms, how tall those, I'm sorry, berms, no, how tall those levees would be. We would not even be able to visually see the, the wetlands from, from ground level. Okay, next slide. I'm sorry, I'm trying to go very fast. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the statement by Anthony Morales that I wanna have on record. I'm not, he's, he's, he's for him. And so if you would read this, he's supporting John Tommy's uh, um, uh, YouTube issues there, but he also, as you can see and read uh, on uh, further that he's, he is a state and federal government uh, recognized to represent the, the Native American issues on much. wetlands. And so he um, offers Jason, his- You've case. submitted this to, we have this in the record and we can- okay. So thank, thank you very you. much. I know it's, too, it's, it's not a, it's yeah. a lot of trouble. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Ms. David. Our next speaker is Jeanette Bosberg, uh, followed by Richard Harmel, followed by Jonathan Coffin. Uh, Ms. Vosberg, you can uh, unmute yourself and start your video and be sure to restate your name for the record. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I am Jeanette Foster, Grassroots Coalition board member. My concern is the removal of the unpermitted drains at Biona Wetlands. I refer you to our attorney Todd Cardiff's letter dated August 5th, 2020 to Mandy Ravel and his attachment of a letter dated March 2nd, 2019. Coastal Commissioner Peskin said it best at a Coastal Commission meeting I attended on March 14, 2017, when he expressed frustration as follows. I see a little bit of a double standard as it relates to when you guys are in the tough position of dealing with a fellow state agency, as we saw with Oceana Dunes. And I'm having trouble grappling with why we did not why we had to have a private party do this three years later. The commissioners, after Peskin spoke and all of the commissioners spoke, they followed the discussion by unanimously voting to approve a modified option to abandon the drains requiring solely removal and to reduce the time frame for completion of the removal from five years to one year. This was absolutely clear to both the Coastal Commission staff, CDFW, and all of the audience. The question right now is, why are we back here in August 2020 with an attempt by staff to again stifle the Coastal Commissioner's voices in 2017? I don't understand it, and it looks like the fix is really on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Great, our next speaker is uh, Richard Harmel. Mr. Harmel, you may uh, unmute yourself and uh, state your name for the record. Commissioners, thanks for the opportunity to present today. My name is Richard Harmel. I'm a member of Sierra Club Airport Marina Group Executive Committee. Today, I'll speak on my own behalf for the protection and preservation of Biona. What happens when any policy or procedure is based on erroneous assumptions. I wish to bring commissioners' attentions to two false assumptions CDFW is using in its arguments for delaying the removal of the illegal drains and for its justification to bulldoze by Iona. Regarding the drains, the whole premise for postponing the removal of the illegal drains is an assumption. There's no need to remove the drains now because once the bulldozing begins, the drains are gonna be gone anyway. Commissioners, this false assumption is based on some unknown and unknowable future event hypothesizing that CDFW's bulldozing plan is inevitable. It's not. There are tremendous hurdles and obstacles that CDFW will have to overcome before any bulldozer's blade will be permitted to destroy Biona. It's the same kind of assumption CDFW made as its justification for bulldozing Biona, another erroneous assumption. Namely, Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve is a traditional open full tidal saltwater bay. It is not. CDFW has failed to provide vetted scientific evidence to support its open full tidal saltwater bay hypothesis. Substantiated scientific historic ecological evidence proves Biona is traditionally a closed freshwater brackish marsh estuary. CDFW places its whole plan to bull, bulldoze Biona on another false assumption. The state has empowered CDFW to be the steward of public lands in Biona. In an ironic and tragic twist, CDFW is leading the charge to bulldoze out, out and destroy the very endangered ecosystems it's been mandated to protect and preserve. Commissioners, please call for a study to examine assumptions CDFW is using to base plans for procedures that will negatively impact Biona forever. Please call for the immediate removal of these harmful illegal drains. Finally, please refuse to permit CDFW's plan to bulldoze the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harmel. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Koff. Uh, Coffin, I'm having a little difficulty finding you in the list. If you can raise your hand, please, I can bring you into the meeting. Okay, hang on just a second, I'll bring you in. Okay, Mr. Coffin, you are in the meeting. You should be able to unmute yourself and uh, start your video. Uh, my name is Jonathan Coffin. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Jonathan Coffin. I'm a, I'm a volunteer and a stakeholder of Biona. I've been, I've been uh, observing and photographing Biona wetlands now for 20 years. So I have some photographs I want to show that more accurately describe what is around the drains today. So this first photo you can see, here's the south drain. And all, all that green that you're seeing on the sides, that's all pickleweed. That's a wetland obligate plant that's there now. That, that whole flat area is the wetland plain, they're wetland soils. Uh, there's also a Crested Truxillensis on that, on that path. It's hard, that's a small plant, it's hard to see uh, in this photograph. But anyway, uh, you can see there's quite a lot of pickleweed in there. That, that one, that one uh, bush up here in the, where the trail leads down is actually, uh, uh, that's a coyote bush and then up uh, above is the, uh, is where the uh, culvert passes under the, the road. Anyway, next next photograph. Uh, this is this is uh, looking south towards Jefferson from the drain. So you can see that whole area, the, the pickleweed, the wetland obligate plant, pickleweed stretching all the way towards uh, Jefferson. So that's a considerable amount of wetland vegetation there. It more accurately reflects what is there today. This was just a week ago. Next photograph. This is the drain again and all the pickleweed. This is, so you're, now you're looking towards Col, uh, Culver and there's the pickleweed along the side. There's a little bit of uh, alkali mallow there, mostly pickleweed though, uh, wetland obligate plant there. And uh, 
you can see the uh, wetland soils next to the drain, the cracks there, it's flat. This is flat area. This, this area gets inundated with water during rain events and the drains are covered. Uh, next photo. Uh, looking down from the path towards the, uh, towards the drain, you can see uh, the, the pickleweed, you can see alkali mallow, uh, you can see the uh, crested truxillensis along the path. The path is bare because uh, people walk up and down it towards the drain. That's why it's bare. It's not bare because there's something wrong with it. The path. Uh, okay, Thank I think you very much. And our next speaker is uh, James Garrett, followed by Miriam Fano. Uh, Mr. Garrett, you are uh, able to unmute yourself and start your video. Yes. Hello, um, did you? There, how's that? That's better. There we go, Mr. Garrett. There you go. Okay. Um, if you could please pull up the videos from uh, Grassroots Coalition that uh, she gave for me to talk about. Uh, you're going to have to give me a name, sir. These are James Garrett. Oh, my name yeah, is. Yeah, I do Garrett. not have a. Yes, you do. Keep your slides. 4, 16, 17. Item 16 and 17. Absolutely. 16C and 17A, yes. Is this a presentation that was submitted on your behalf? Yes, there are videos as well. Was this submitted by Ms. McPherson? So yes. that would be the video, Billy, that I sent you later this afternoon. Uh, under the name of McPherson? Yes. Oh, James Garrett. But my videos are on my email that I stated to you would be presented by James Garrett. All right, Mr. Garrett. Ms. McPherson, if, Mr. Garrett, if you want to testify on behalf of yourself as an individual, please proceed. You have two minutes. And your, he has the videotapes. All right, so please proceed. Okay, so you're going to run the videos. Um, the first video is uh, uh, the uh, dream. And see the bubbles coming up. Those bubbles are methane or gas from the from the gas well. We tested them. I know the fire department tested them. Didn't find them. We tested them with our own meter, and it went off. Um, the second video. Wait a, a minute. Wait a minute. What second video? There are four. All right. There's four. Hold on, hold on. Just All right. literally freeze right where you're at. This is not an opportunity to basically extend a, what is essentially a group presentation. No, it's you, not. You know, I, yes, was... Ms. McPherson, you are not recognized. Mr. Garrett is the speaker. Thank you very much. You had five minutes earlier. Mr. Garrett, we're not going to play five different videos for your individual testimony. That's I okay. really apologize for that. You have one minute and 25 seconds. Please complete the statement. All the gas presence. Mr. Garrett, you're recognized for another. Yes, can you play the the volatile gas yes. present? Mr. Garrett, you have a minute and fifteen seconds. All right. Um, so the uh, the SOMAS reports were debunked by uh, your, your staff in uh, 2017. The visual is showing the overtopping of the water with the drain proved that SOMAS modeling was inaccurate. The Reed report also was debunked by your staff in 2014. Engels relies on old reports that have been re debunked. Um, Dad, uh, over at uh, Owens Lake, she's worked with Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. She's worked with the federal, state, and local governments. She's committed to watershed and uh, wetlands restoration. She holds her doctorate in biology and plant ecology from the University of California at Irvine. And I hope you have that queued up. Show it. Oh. Dr. Griswold's um, presentation. For allowing me to speak today on yes. the unpermitted Bravo. drains and their removal 
from the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. I want to comment on Jonah Engel's staff report of July 23rd, 2020. Ms. Engel refers to the CDFW Biona project as a restoration. Again, you've heard me say it before many times, it's not a restoration or even close to it. There is recent science shown on this page indicates the project to bulldoze Biona is not a restoration. I read with interest her report of July 23rd that apparently the unpermitted drains are in an area so biologically sensitive that they should not be removed until... The Ms. Fungal, you have a video in front of us which is three minutes long. You've used 50 seconds of it and it's essentially some more testimony from what it sounds like is Ms. McPherson. Is that correct? Uh, no, this is from uh, Dr. Griswold. Okay, forgive me. Um, you have not that much time left to play the whole video. So could you summarize uh, your uh, testimony? We're interested in hearing your opinion, but if you could please as much as, Sure, I, I just play as much as possible because she really is the expert okay. and she has been proven to be the expert. So I'd love to have you to share this with you. All right, but you don't have enough time. As soon as the time expires, we'll have to move on to the when next. When it expires, that's fine. But right. you can always go back and see it on your own. All right, let's run the clock and Billy play it until the clock runs out. Thank you. Bulldozing happened. Okay, her report reinforces what the proponents of an ecologically efficient pro project have said. All of Biona is too valuable to continue on the path of massive bulldozing. Let's get to the drain. Here we see a picture of the south drain. Thank you very much. Uh, no, next speaker, please. Our next speaker is uh, Diane Fletcher Hope. Uh, Ms. Hope, you can uh, unmute yourself. And Hi, begin can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, fine, thank you. I'd like to lead, read a list of the organizations that are opposed to the bulldozing of Biona wetlands. There are 39 organizations, and I'd like to list them. The Green Dream Campaign with Molly Basler, Angels for Animal Rescue with Joanna Krupa, World Animal News with Katie Cleary, The Animal Rescue Mission, Shira Astroff, Torrance Democratic Club, Progressive Democrats of Santa Monica Mountains, West LA Democratic Club, LAX Democratic Club, Pacific Palisades Democratic Club, Westchester Playa Democratic Club, their turn, um, Donnie Moss, Jane Unchained, Jane Velez Mitchell, Solartopia, Harvey Wasserman, Lady Freethinker, Nina Jackal, Biona Institute, Los Angeles Audubon Society, Canyon Back, Back Alliance, Climate Reality Project, Los Angeles Chapter, In Defense of Animals, Culver City Democratic Club, Azul, Animal Pac, Col California Cultural Resource Preservation Alliance, Inc., Delray Residents Association, Coalition to Preserve LA, Christians Caring for Creation, Resource Renewal Institute, Sierra Club, Eastwood Ranch Foundation, Earth Race Conservation, Los Angeles, Food and Water Watch, Indivisible 43, Land Protection Partners, Biona Ecosystem Education Project, Grassroots Coalition, Defense of Place, Protect Playa Now, Alliance for Survival, and Union Members for the Preservation of Wildlife. 39 groups that are opposed to the bulldozing of Biona wetlands. Surely this must be paid attention to. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, we have two speakers we're not able to identify, uh, Joe Ferris and Carl Hope. If you can raise your hands, uh, we'll pull you into the meeting. Um, Ms. Hanscom will be our next speaker. I'll bring you into the meeting. I should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, Ms. Hanscom, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Um. First honorable chair, I was told by staff that I was supposed to be part of a group and somehow they had me in as an individual. I don't know how that happened. So, well, I apologize for that miscommunication, but you have two minutes all to yourself. 
Okay, so I don't have five minutes like they- No, ma'am, you have, you have two minutes. Okay. Well, honorable Chair and Honorable Commissioners, Marcia Hanscom with the Biona Wetlands Institute. Um, I've loved this land since 1995. And I am so grateful to Jonathan Coffin, the naturalist who showed you those photographs of the uh, wetland vegetation coming back. In 2017, when we were at the commission and we showed you photographs of the of what it used to look like when the rain would pond in this area versus what it was looking like then, it was stark distinction. And this last year, because CDFW and Playa Vista did not cap the drains into when they were supposed to, this last rainy season was the first time we actually had the kind of water ponding from the rain that we had had in the past. And that's why you have all this vegetation that he was showing you. So I want to say that, uh, you know, we uh, support part of what the staff is recommending. We do not think we should be bringing in big equipment, heavy equipment to take out those drains because, you know, Fish and Wildlife, that's the one good thing they said here. And that is, that it would be disturbing to the ecology, disturbing to the fish and wildlife, to the, to the plants and animals that are there. And we need to not disturb this park of land, especially with all of this plant, plant life coming back. So please do not remove the drains right now. I agree with that. Don't remove them in five years. They shouldn't be removed at all. <laughs> Um, maybe what Dr. Williams suggested of filling in with the cement makes more sense. Um, but definitely bringing in heavy equipment to extricate these drains that never should have been put there, that's just wrong. For 24 years, the drains have been not allowing the rainwater to seep in. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, I believe that's our last speaker. We're able to no, identify no, the. No, 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 no. Uh, I believe there's a scientist, Robert Vandehoek, that signed up. Thank you. Uh, yes. Not in our we speaker have a list. Request from them at all, staff. He, we do not. Okay. Uh, that'll conclude our speakers. Um, we will come back to Mr. Burt for uh, rebuttal. Mr. Berg from Fish and Wildlife in the meeting. How much time, sir? Yes, I'm sorry. I was having trouble unmuting. So it, it won't take long. I just wanted to clarify a couple. Sure. I I'm think sorry. you had about two or three minutes left on the balance of your time, if I recall. Did... OK, I just it, it shouldn't take that long. I just wanted to clarify a couple of uh, points. Is uh, The drains would be removed. Uh, the proposal is to remove them, whether or not the project happens within five years or not. And uh, the second point is uh, our information indicates that the drain have no effect now. So the delay doesn't have any effect on, on the ecological uh, values of the reserve. And, and I think that does it unless uh, Brody or Kevin has, has anything else to add. All right, do we have additional comments on rebuttal from the applicant? Uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, Richard Brody or Kevin Takai have anything else to add, if they are unmuted or not. It doesn't appear so, so let's just move, move forward. I appreciate that. Mr. Burt. All right, we'll bring it back to staff for any closing Excuse comment. Me. Chair Padilla, before we do that, we identified that Robert Vanderhoek signed up for, we had him under general public comment, but he is in the meeting and did try to sign up. So we have him ready to go. The person okay. we were just talking about. So he, tried, he attempted to sign up with respect to this item? He did, and it's possible that we miscategorized him. Okay, in that case, then let's bring him in and take his testimony. Mr. Ravin. Mr. Vanderhoek, you are in the meeting. You may unmute yourself and start your video. Please state your name for the record. Hi, before you start, um, 
Well, my name is Robert uh, Young, uh, nicknamed Roy Vandehook, and I'm a scientist. And Marsha Hanscom is who brought up, I'm the founder and president of the Biona Institute, which she was going to speak as the executive director. But uh, you only gave her two minutes instead of five. And I think that might be inappropriate um, to have done that. Um, maybe you can give those minutes to me or bring her back to do that, but that would be the right thing to do. Um, so well, unfortunately, I, Mr. Vanderhoek, I don't, I don't uh, have all the details and I don't have time at the moment to do an investigation into what happened, but certainly I don't think it could be said that your organization didn't have ample opportunity to testify collectively or individually. So you're welcome to proceed. I'll give you two and a half minutes. Well, I was purged actually, and it was even brought to your attention by Marsha Hanscom, but I'm grateful to be able to speak again and, and that your, your uh, audio staff found uh, the error and admitted to it. That's very, that's very good, very good. What's your testimony? Okay, uh, thank you for the extra time. <clears throat> um, I don't see my picture there yet, but it my, is my video? Is my picture? Yes. Okay, I can see you, Mr. Stephen Padilla. Um, so yes. Okay, I wish that uh, as a scientist, uh, Dr. Engel and Ms. Engel uh, of your staff are, are correct in, uh, and the staff report uh, saying not to remove the drains. Very important that you concur with them. They came to that conclusion partly correctly, but partly incorrectly from various kinds of information, including members of the public, some of the members of the public, and also from the state agency and that. So the state agency though, is, uh, Fish and Wildlife is correct and also not wanting to remove the drain. <clears throat> As you can see from the photographs of Jonathan Coffin and my field work, uh, he listed to you three native plants, all three of them wetland indicators. And when you have them together, you have a guild. Now, why I brought up Dr. Ingle getting to the right conclusion for, but for the, some of the wrong reason for leaving the drains is, is that uh, Dr. Ingle is not able to visit a site regularly, daily, or even weekly or monthly as Jonathan Coffin. So with her limited visit, even as a scientist, you can make errors. And so she did not see those three species of wetland indicators as a guild. And, and predominance of way over 50%, actually 100% wetland vegetation in, in that area. Uh, I better say the species legally, pickleweed is Salicornia virginica, now sometimes called Sarcocornia pacifica, a name change, Malvella leprosa, alkali mallow, and Cressa truxolensis, uh, English name is uh, uh, like an alkali clover. <clears throat> and they are home for habitat for butterflies. Um, and that shows that the area is at a very low elevation, uh, just barely above sea level. And the elevations given by John or for, for Dr. Ingle are given in other areas. Wanted to be sure to get that on the record. I do not think you should use blackberry as one that you should remove that plant from the list as a vegetation. I've done extensive work on the historical ecology, looking at herbarium records from way over a hundred years ago that show there was no um, blackberry in this area. So that should be removed. And in my last few seconds, I do want you to know that several endangered uh, songbirds and rare uh, sensitive status species of birds are, and lizards are using the pompous grass. So there's no removal of the pompous grass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanderhoek. All right, staff, that concludes the speakers, correct? Yes, it does. That that was the final speaker. All right. And then staff, we wanted to come back to you for closing comments. Thank you. In the interest of time, staff is going to keep its comments uh, very succinct. And I would just make one, one note. Uh, and that is just to summarize what is the question before us today. And that is simply regarding the timing for removal. The project is for the complete removal of these drains and their associated pipes. There are two co-equal alternatives that are proposed. And uh, although Fish and Game has a, a very distinct preference, they would prefer the uh, flexibility to have the longer five-year term. They have indicated that they are prepared to uh, implement either proposal based on the commission's direction. Now, the purpose though, is, as was explained in our presentation, is that the five years doesn't 
uh, tie it uh, to that larger restoration project, except that it allows for the flexibility to so that we only have the disturbance occur once. If that large if that larger restoration project can occur within that time frame, then we limit the amount of disturbance. If it can't, then uh, we don't believe that there's any additional impacts from allowing that additional flexibility uh, for that time. So with that, I'll just conclude my comments and note that we are available for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Hudson. Appreciate the work. We'll bring it back to the uh, commission for questions and discussion or deliberation. Commissioner Uranga. Thank you, Chair Padilla. I just uh, want to acknowledge that uh, this discussion has been going on as well with the uh, Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission that I was appointed to by our great uh, former president, Dana Bosco. So I've been attending these meetings for what, three years, going on three years now. And uh, th it's controversial. I mean, there's no question about that. And I think one of the biggest uh, controversies is the fact of what's, what's the definition of restoration? And what's the definition of restoration of salt water versus fresh water? What is the restoration that's going to, uh, to take place there? The fact that the drains are there uh, is a mistake. I mean, th th there's no question about that. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. And now they're creating some havoc. And so now they need to be removed. And that creates another sense, another area of havoc that, uh, for, for that area. One of the, uh, one of the missing items in, the, in this whole presentation that was brought up near the end is that there's a very thriving animal life in, in that area as well that uh, is also uh, due protection. And this project would uh, basically upset that type of habitat as well for, for the uh, living species that are there, the birds and the frogs and the lizards and everything else that, that uh, resides in that habitat. So I'm conflicted at this point. I mean, you know, I want to be able to get what's a, you know, a restore whatever it is, whether it's sea or salt. I mean, whether it's salt or, or fresh, but at the same time, I want to protect what's there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there. I'm gonna listen to the uh, to the uh, further conversation from my colleagues, uh, but I but it's it's been a controversial subject as well. And it's, it's one that has no easy answers. Uh, and it's uh, something that we need to really look at much more carefully uh, as we move forward on this today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Uranga. Commissioner Escalante. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions for staff. Um, is it possible that these drains can be reopened and functional easily? So the, uh, I'll, I'll answer that. For sure, where we're at right now, no, okay. Yeah, absolutely, I'd be happy to answer that in Fish and Wildlife, uh, if you would like and provide additional detail. These drains have been uh, capped at this point using uh, a permanent sealant and, and bolted. Of course, that theoretically could be removed, uh, but they would not. And our condition actually requires, our special condition one requires that they be maintained in a closed state until they are permanently removed. I, I appreciate that answer, Mr. Hassan. I think that, that that gets to my question. And my second, this is a very interesting argument from um, some of the public testimony at the end, talking about it's less harmful to keep the uh, pipes there and just fill them in as opposed to do all the bulldozing and taking it out. Um, and I do want to be do the most environmentally friendly thing. So uh, for the welfare of the wetlands, so they can be, you know, productive wetlands. So can you address that issue, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, interestingly, that was the original proposal by Fish and Wildlife in 2017. Their original proposal was a removal or abandonment. And abandonment would typically involve uh, filling the pipes with a concrete slurry and simply leaving it in place. Uh, that was uh, debated during that 2017 hearing and in the final condition that was approved by the uh, commission, this follow-up permit application was required for complete removal and did, did, did not consider abandonment. Of course, uh, the commission has the discretion to make those sorts of changes. Our, your hands are not tied for this new permit action. 
but I just wanted to lay that history out that that was part of that previous debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Brownsey. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> A question to staff. Um, if for some reasons the um, uh, within the next five years, the project to restore Fiona is delayed. Uh, will this removal of these drains still go forward? Yes, our, our condition requires that they be removed at the time that the larger restoration project occurs or within five years, whichever is sooner. There is a, a small amount of discretion for the executive director to extend that period of time for good cause if and only if uh, there is evidence, clear evidence, that the implementation of that larger restoration project is imminent. So that's the way the condition is worded now. Uh, thank you very much for that response. Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, I don't remember all the details of our 2017 uh, hearing, but I think that we uh, had a full debate. I remember that, a very in-depth debate. And it just seems to me that the commission made the decision that it did after careful consideration. Uh, I do remember that some of us were concerned about timing uh, because we felt like some of the elements of the Biona restoration have dragged on for years, if not decades. Having said that, I still think this proposal from uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, and uh, with the conditions that staff have articulated is a common sense approach uh, to this issue. And uh, unless there are other questions or concerns, um, I'd like to start the two motions uh, on, this, on this item. Thank you, Vice Chair Brownsey. Are there other commissioners who wanna be recognized for questions or deliberation? I don't see any, um, Vice Chair Brownsey. I think they want us to take up the amendment first, if I'm correct. It is that uh, 17? Uh, 17A, that's correct. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I move that the commission approve coastal development permit amendment number 5-17-0253-A1 pursuant to the staff recommendation and I'm requesting an I vote. Second. Thank you. Moved by Brownsey Bochco. Do uh, you guys want to speak further to your motion or to your second? Commissioner no, Bonner. I just want to say very briefly, I agree with uh, Commissioner Uranga 100%. This is a really difficult situation. Um, but I think staff has, you know, followed this for years and has really put the time in to make the most sensible decisions. So I'm for the staff report. Thank you, Commissioner Bachko. Commissioner Uranga, did, Uranga, did you want to be recognized again? No, I think uh, Commissioner Bosco has uh, expressed my my uh, my feelings. All right, sir. Thank you. The mover and the seconder are asking for an I vote, a yes vote. Is there any further discussion or deliberation? Seeing none, we will move to a roll call vote. Mr. Staven. Commissioner Rice. Yes. Rice, yes. Commissioner Turnbull Sanders. Yes. Turnbull Sanders, yes. Commissioner Uranga. Aye. Commissioner Uranga, yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Amanzada? Yes. Amanzada, yes. Commissioner Bochco? Yes. Bochco, yes. Commissioner Brownsey? Aye. Brownsey, yes. Commissioner Escalante? Yes. Escalante, yes. Commissioner Groom? Yes. Groom, yes. Commissioner Hart? Yes. Hart, yes. Commissioner Howe? Aye. Howe, yes. Chair Padilla? Aye. Chair Padilla, yes. The vote's unanimous. Thank you, sir. With that, the findings are adopted and the application for the permit amendment is approved. Um, Vice Chair Brownsey. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that the commission approve coastal development permit 5-18-0554 pursuant to the staff recommendation and I'm asking for an aye vote. Second. 
Thank you. Moved by Brown Z. Bochco. Either want to speak to further to your motions? Uh, just to say, uh, uh, I want to associate myself with uh, Commissioner Uranga and Bochco's calling out of the complexity and the, um, the challenging nature of this. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ditto that. Are there other commissioners who'd like to comment or deliberate? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mover and seconder asking for a yes vote. Mr. Staven. Commissioner Turnbull Sanders. Yes. Turnbull Sanders, yes. Commissioner Uranga. Aye. Uranga, yes. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Wilson, yes. Commissioner Amanzada. Yes. Amanzada, yes. Commissioner Bochco. Yes. Bochco, yes. Commissioner Brownsey. Aye. Brownsey, yes. Commissioner Escalante. Yes. Escalante, yes. Commissioner Groom. Yes. Groom, yes. Commissioner Hart. Yes. Hart, yes. Commissioner Howe. Aye. Howe, yes. Commissioner Rice. Yes. Rice, yes. Chair Padilla. Aye. Chair Padilla, yes. The vote is unanimous, sir. Thank you all. With that, the findings are adopted and the permit application is approved. Thank you all for your work and your patience.